Anesthesia is intended to help people not feel pain, to feel less anxious, and or to not be aware of painful stimuli, such as during surgery or non-surgical procedures. The practice of anesthesiology in the realm of the operating room in hospitals, surgery centers, or private clinic takes on the responsibility to keep a patient as safe as possible before, during, and after surgery. Although there is significant science behind the anesthesia profession, it is also an art when personalizing its delivery for each unique individual who may not always respond the same as others. Although numbing medicine called local anesthesia may be used for smaller procedures in clinics by physicians or surgeons, other forms of anesthesia are typically delivered by anesthesiologists and or nurse anesthetists. Anesthesiology is one of the few fields of medicine that involves providers from different training tracks but with specialized training that coincide within a shared environment. Anesthesiologists who are physicians and certified registered nurse anesthetists, also known as CRNAs, are the predominant providers in the arena of anesthesia. However, there are some states that have certified anesthesiologist assistants, also known as CAAs, but these account for less than 1% of all anesthesia providers. Depending on the state and the setting, you may have anesthesia administered just by a physician anesthesiologist only, by a CRNA only, or by an anesthesia care team, which can include an anesthesiologist with a CRNA and or an anesthesiologist assistant. The depth and breadth of medical knowledge increases from CAA to CRNA to anesthesiologist, with CAAs having the least clinical experience required and are not able to work independently as they are medically directed and supervised by the anesthesiologist. However, the extent of experience can vary from individual to individual and can also depend on the years of clinical experience after training. Each track of professionals are certified by different bodies that have specific continuing education standards. Although significant training is received by both anesthesiologists and CRNAs, each anesthesia provider brings their own unique communication style, personality, years of experience, and skill sets to the surgical world. Those with the most experience, such as physician anesthesiologists, are typically managing the more complicated patients or settings such as an intensive care unit. Adult patients are typically instructed not to eat for eight hours prior to surgery to minimize the risk of solid food from coming up and going into the lungs, also known as aspiration, when patients receive anesthesia. Water may be allowed up to two hours before surgery, but each facility may have slightly different instructions depending on the patient, surgery, and anesthesia provider preferences. On patient arrival, patients will be asked to disrobe partially or completely and wear a simple gown to allow placement of monitors, clean the surgical site easily, and to allow further access to the body in case of emergency. An intravenous line, or IV, will typically be placed by a preoperative nurse or the anesthesia provider to allow either sedation prior to or upon arrival to the operating room or procedure room. If not done prior to the day of surgery, your anesthesiologist and or nurse anesthetist will review your medical record and ask detailed questions to ensure they are comfortable with you proceeding with anesthesia for surgery. They should also ask if you have any concerns or questions about the anesthesia plan explained to you. There are multiple ways of helping people not feel pain, to be less anxious, and or to be unconscious. Sedation or monitored anesthesia care can be given at different levels from mild to moderate to deep. However, the level of sleepiness is on a spectrum and not just three categories. Each patient may need different levels of medications, typically through an IV, to reach the same level of anesthesia. Mild sedation is just enough to take the edge off anxiety or pain, but the patient can still communicate and be aware of their surroundings with a chance they may or may not remember details later on, depending on the patient and the medications used. Moderate sedation is slightly deeper with the possibility of falling asleep, but with the ability to awaken easily. Chances of recall later are less. Deep sedation enables the patient to fall asleep with an increased risk of more shallow and slower breathing. This deep sedation is typical with some procedures like colonoscopies, which is not technically surgery. It is going into a hole that is already there and uncomfortable for many without sedation. Because sedation can depress breathing, various ways of delivering oxygen is used to supplement patients. Nasal cannulas are devices that are placed just inside the nostrils to not only deliver oxygen, but sometimes can have a separate tubing that allows connection to a monitor to detect carbon dioxide. This allows the anesthesia provider to get continuous feedback on how often you are breathing. A face mask is another device that can be used with higher flows of oxygen, which may have a carbon dioxide monitor added as well. 
When deep sedation causes some obstruction in the upper airway, there are times the anesthesia provider must lift the patient's chin or place a small airway in the mouth or nose. This helps the breathing patient get their own air in and out of the neck or mouth area without obstructing. These same devices can help an anesthesia provider deliver air or oxygen to the patient's lungs when the patient is obstructing and needs assistance if there is no breathing tube in place. Some deep sedation can enter an unconscious level of anesthesia that does not allow the patient to wake up despite all attempts. This is called general anesthesia. It is important to know that if general anesthesia is being avoided and only mild to moderate sedation is being used, then there is always a chance of recall or waking up but it is not usually a concern when a patient is constantly monitored to ensure comfort. General anesthesia does not necessarily mean you stop breathing, but it is not uncommon. Some people have airway obstruction when all of the neck tissues and or jaw relax significantly, which is why an anesthesia provider is important to tend to you. General anesthesia means that you are completely unconscious. It is extremely rare to wake up during a surgery when you have an attentive anesthesia provider administering continuous anesthesia. When you are receiving general anesthesia, it is not uncommon to be taken to the operating room with or without relaxing medicine, such as midazolam, or a pain medication such as fentanyl. Upon arrival to the operating room, you may or may not be asked to move to another bed, which you may be aware at the time you are doing it, but may be unable to recall later. And then multiple monitors will be placed on you prior to fully going to sleep. Propofol is the most common intravenous medication used in adults to get patients asleep and into general anesthesia. However, in young children, it is very common to take them to the operating room with no IV and have them breathe volatile anesthetic, or commonly known by the lay public as gas, to get them asleep and then put in an IV if it is more than a brief procedure or surgery. Most adult patients are transitioned to receiving a gas, such as sevoflurane, after receiving propofol. Propofol is a quick-on, quick-off medication and would need to be continuously administered through the IV to remain asleep. It can be significantly easier to administer and titrate gas for longer procedures. Side effects from propofol are rare, but side effects from the gas, strong painkillers like opioids, and a few other anesthesia-specific drugs can cause nausea, which is why nearly all patients who receive anesthesia automatically receive an anti-nausea medication prior to finishing anesthesia. Other potential side effects from anesthesia can include allergic reactions, headaches, confusion, double vision, and drowsiness. A rare life-threatening reaction to anesthesia, known as malignant hyperthermia, requires special treatment and any history of this in the patient or blood-related family members should be shared as soon as possible with the surgeon and anesthesiologist prior to going to surgery. If a general anesthetic is chosen, it is typically delivered via a more specialized airway device, frequently called a laryngeal mask airway, or LMA. The placement of an LMA does not require finding the vocal cords. The LMA just sits behind and a little below the tongue, but above the vocal cords. It's rare to have a sore throat, but some mild irritation for a day or two may be noticed. In fact, I find that most patients were unaware that they had something in their throat when they speak of their prior surgeries. I remind patients that they really don't want anyone in the room breathing the same gas that they are breathing or we could have a problem. Containing that gas in a tube for just the patient is really the ideal situation. This is also important to contain higher levels of oxygen from being exposed to any nearby cautery, which some surgeons need to control bleeding. If any stomach acid was to come up, then an LMA does not protect the patient from aspiration. This is why an anesthesia provider is there to ensure you have not had anything to eat or drink within the prescribed time frame, and to ensure your safety by suctioning any contents from your mouth, throat, or trachea in the rare case of regurgitation, and then place a breathing tube to keep you safe. In the video, you will see that I am being given propofol and I suddenly look lifeless. The anesthesiologist temporarily helped me breathe with the mask and then again with the LMA until I could begin breathing again on my own, which occurs as the propofol wears off. I was not paralyzed for the placement of the LMA. You will notice that I was responding to the LMA because my nervous system is still able to react to things done to me, but I was unaware of what I was doing, nor did I have any recall. During the surgery, my eyes were lightly taped to avoid my eyes from drying out and to avoid corneal abrasions, which are scratches on the eyeball. Those that get scratches on the eye usually occur when the patient is not aware of what they are doing and can scratch themselves, and many times the patient is rubbing their eyes or nose as they are starting to wake up. Upon removal of the LMA, you will notice some lovely saliva, which is normal. 
If you're having a surgery that requires a regular breathing tube or you have a high risk of aspiration, then a special instrument is used to open your mouth to see the vocal cords to place the breathing tube, also known as the endotracheal tube, gently between the cords. This is the standard laryngoscope or instrument used to open patients' mouths. In the video, the patient consented to videotaping, but the eyes were covered for privacy reasons. After propofol and pain medication such as fentanyl is given, a paralytic or paralyzing medication is given to allow the vocal cords to relax and open for intubation. For the purposes of showing you a better picture, a video scope, which is useful for patients whose vocal cords are difficult to see with a standard instrument, was used. A rigid stylet may or may not be used for intubation depending on the circumstance and provider preference. The stylet in the endotracheal tube or breathing tube allows the tip of the tube to enter up and into the trachea via the vocal cords with more leverage. The stylet is removed after the tube is introduced into the top of the trachea. It is not necessary to keep the stylet in the endotracheal tube as the tube is being pushed down into the trachea. Paralyzing medications may be needed for the surgery itself at times, but many times it is only used for placing the breathing tube. The fear of being awake and not being able to move is extremely rare and usually found in compromising situations of already low blood pressure in some pregnant women, some heart bypass surgeries, or trauma situations. It is not uncommon for general anesthesia to cause a mild drop in blood pressure, and so the further drops in blood pressure from these low blood pressure scenarios mentioned can compromise the patient's organs such as the brain and or a fetus. During general anesthesia, your vital signs such as your blood pressure, heart rate, oxygen levels, etc. are monitored continuously by the anesthesia provider while the surgeon does surgery. Dosing of any antibiotics is discussed with the surgeon prior to incision if they are needed. An operating room nurse assists both the surgeon and anesthesia provider to ensure patient safety as well. It is fairly common in many surgeries to place compressive socks and or devices on the lower legs of patients to prevent blood clots. To add special warmers to keep patients warm in a colder environment while receiving anesthesia, as you do lose some heat when your veins dilate from the gas anesthesia, and sometimes place a catheter in the bladder to drain urine for longer surgeries or special cases. There are times when surgeons prefer that anesthesia providers provide regional anesthesia to help with avoiding general anesthesia for various reasons, to provide longer pain relief than just their own local anesthesia at the surgical site, and or place a block catheter for longer delivery of numbing medication, perhaps for two to three days. Regional anesthesia can include spinal injections and or epidural catheters for trunk, abdominal, or lower extremity pain coverage. Vaginal deliveries or cesarean sections are commonly covered by this type of regional anesthesia. However, shoulders, arms, or legs can be numbed up by nerve blocks that address various nerves. Ultrasound is commonly used for nerve blocks when available. Sedation may or may not be used for a block, which is many times done prior to the surgery in a holding area. However, this can vary. The local anesthetic is not, and should not, be injected into the nerve, but rather near the nerve to allow for absorption over time, which can vary from patient to patient and depends which local anesthetic is used. If ordered or agreed upon by the surgeon, patient, and anesthesia provider, catheters may be left in place for nerve blocks. However, the concentration of the local anesthetic in those catheter delivery systems are typically lower than the initial bolus of local anesthetic given for the surgery. This is done for safety reasons to avoid high levels of local anesthetic in the patient. Sometimes a twitch monitor may be used to give additional information for the anesthesia provider to additionally confirm the correct nerve or nerves. If there is no ultrasound available, a twitch monitor may be used by itself. However, with more experienced anesthesia providers using ultrasound when available, it is not always necessary to use a twitch monitor. There are times when blocks can be patchy, meaning that parts of the nerve or nerves are blocked. Additional blocks and or intravenous or oral pain medications can be used to complement the partial block to address any significant post-surgery acute pain. When the surgeon finishes the surgery, he or she typically will go speak with the family. 
Many are not aware that there is still time needed for the anesthesia provider to transition the patient out of their anesthesia and to the post-anesthesia recovery unit or other monitored area. There may also be delays if the surgeon has an assistant who helps close the wound. Many families and friends are in distress from waiting so long to see their loved one who just had surgery. However, the reality is that the operating room team and recovery room team are actively caring for the patient, and if they take their eyes and hands off the patient to communicate with the patient's family or friends, then that can take away from attention from the patient. Patience and understanding of this can help decrease anxiety. Also, ask about the surgeon's plans for updates before the patient goes back for surgery. This can help the surgeon and team have a plan for updates. But remember, there can be changes or issues to contend with on the fly that are not necessarily life-threatening that can put family updates on the back burner when the priority is with the patient. It's not just about risks of anesthesia and surgery, but also the type of health that a patient brings to that surgery. Surgery is technically trauma and anesthesia is additional stress with potential side effects. The resilience of your body and careful titration of medications by your anesthesia provider are important factors in successful anesthesia and surgery. If you're a smoker, you already have an increased risk for asthma, cancer, stroke, heart disease, peripheral vascular disease, tooth loss, cataracts, macular degeneration, and general inflammation. However, there are also increased risks around surgery which includes poor wound healing due to decreased blood flow and poor oxygen carrying capacity by your red blood cells. Pneumonia and heart attacks are just some of the other concerns. Quitting smoking before surgery is an ideal time to kick the unhealthy habit, even if it is just the day before. The sooner you quit smoking, the quicker your circulation can improve and your lungs can begin to improve. Your entire body and health benefits from this. If you are a diabetic, it is important to have well-controlled glucose or sugar levels to improve healing, minimize risk for infection, minimize electrolyte abnormalities, etc. Depending on if you are a type 1 diabetic or insulin-dependent diabetic, it is important to discuss with your surgeon or the anesthesiologist if and when to take your medications. If you are extremely overweight or obese, you are already at an increased risk for gastroesophageal reflux, shortness of breath, obstructive sleep apnea, high blood pressure, diabetes, blood clots, cancer, and beyond. At times of surgery, obesity can make it difficult to find or place an IV to help the patient breathe with a mask, to find the airway when trying to place a breathing tube, or make some types of surgeries more difficult for the surgeon due to excess adipose tissue, which can increase surgery and anesthesia time. There is also an increased risk for more rapid drops in oxygen levels due to changes in the lungs from the mechanical effects of the extra weight on the lungs and or deconditioning. Blood clots are another concern, especially during long surgeries or those with clotting disorders. Patients should be optimized with any health issues they have to minimize the risk of anesthesia and surgery. If you are expecting to have elective surgery but have questions about your heart, lungs, recent infections, fevers, poorly controlled diabetes, sleep apnea, blood thinners, etc., then please check with your physician or surgeon before allowing yourself to show up for surgery. There is always a chance that you could be canceled by the anesthesia provider and or surgeon based on the status of your health. If you have a stress test pending or a sleep study pending, then please do those before an elective surgery unless you've been given clearance by a cardiologist and or your surgeon. This will still be reviewed by the anesthesia provider to ensure that they are comfortable putting you under anesthesia. If your surgery is not elective and you're planning to undergo surgery for emergent reasons, then your anesthesia provider is there to ensure that you are as safe as possible during your surgical procedure. If you found this video helpful, have any questions or any suggestions for future videos, please feel free to leave a comment or question in the comment section. You may just find one of your answers in future updates or future videos.